Welcome to tonight's presentation of uh, build, Rebuilding Net Zero After the Fires, Can It Be Done? And my name is Kirsten Freisinger. Uh, I am representing uh, Beecrest tonight, and we also are doing this in coordination with JCRES, as well as the entire Crest community statewide. Uh, I'm a uh, longtime resident of the town of Superior, and uh, it, has, it has been an, an incredibly difficult time for all of us. Uh, and we are very, very, very pleased to have Andrew Mishler here, who is filling in for Mark Attard. I hope you all got the memo. Uh, we're going to move right through the uh, slides, which are looping on me, which is just perfect for my week. Uh, so please uh, bear with me. I'm going to move through the introductions very quickly and then turn it over to Andrew Mitchell, Mishler. I'd like to put a shout out to Cress in particular and ask if uh, if you're not a member, do please consider joining. We've got uh, a couple of different membership levels. And when you go to the Cress uh, website, uh, you can join Cress. You can access the resources and we greatly uh, appreciate the support of uh, all the uh, you know all the members and so forth that it's what keeps us going so please consider joining Cress. Uh, if you want to see what events are going on in Cress, please check out the website and check out the events uh, the events tab and you can see uh, other events that are going on and the upcoming events and you can check out videos uh, under the resources tab if you want to see this video or other videos check out uh, the resources tab i did want to call attention to our policy tab uh, we have a pretty robust policy team here at crest that do a lot of work during the active legislative sessions and i would really encourage everyone to check out the uh, legislative tracker you can go to our main page and check out policy and you can find that legislative tracker and see what Cress is supporting and so forth. I'm going to gloss over this slide, talks a little bit about the background of Cress and uh, keep moving so we can get on with uh, with Andrew's presentation. So uh, I, I'm not going to take much more time here. What I'm going to do is turn this over to Andrew Mitchler who, you know, he did step in for, for Mark Attard who was unable to make this pre presentation due to uh, family emergency. So uh, please welcome Andrew Mitchell, who's, uh, who's really jumped in and been a champion uh, for this event. And uh, Andrew, I have changed the presenter to you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm pitch hitting for Mark Attard uh, tonight. And um, uh, Mark, um, Mark, unfortunately, is, is um, father just passed away so he was he wasn't able to attend mark Attard, um, uh, has been instrumental on um, helping uh, us organize uh, the response to the fire and the fire rebuilding his, his house was actually right at the edge of the fire event and um, he's uh, one of uh, the uh, the many uh, passive house um, builders and designers in our area and he did uh, quite a bit of retrofit in his own home so um, one of the one of the things that he discovered was uh, during all the smoke he turned because he made his house quite airtight. Um, he also um, was able to um, turn off the uh, ventilation system and suffered no smoke uh, issues within the house. And he said most of his neighbors have extensive smoke damage to theirs. So that was one of the many stories that we've gotten from the fire. Some. Most of them quite tragic, uh, of course, uh, and and obviously my heart goes out to you guys, and and this is simply uh, a, the way to kind of support thinking around what rebuilding means, especially when we talk about kind of the carbon friendly design or the net zero scope of things. Um, so that's what he wanted to kind of focus on tonight, and I think it's a good good framework for us. Um, uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm, I've, uh, I think my first uh, NCRES meeting was 2001, maybe, and I've been, uh, I've been part of the NCRES community for a long time. I've been Fort Collins. Um, I did run the chapter for a couple of years, um, and so I'm 
very grateful to see Chris alive and well and doing such amazing work. Um, right now, I'm part of the Rocky Passive House Rocky Mountains chapter and quite involved with Passive House, which uh, I'll talk about tonight, uh, explicitly because there's uh, some breaking news about Passive House and the rebuilding effort. Um, uh, just a little bit about me more personally, as I live up in the mountains here, I built uh, the first certified Passive House in Colorado. And uh, because of the fire situation that we know of, I've been thinking about uh, fire resilience and design for quite a long time. And that actually started in 1991 when my family home burned. And that's actually when I first started um, learning how to um, build, was uh, rebuilding after the Oakland Hills fire with 3,200 homes, unfortunately, uh, went, uh, went away and had to be rebuilt over the next uh, five to 10 years. So um, quickly tonight, um, I'm going to go over three main topics. Uh, one we discussed uh, a little bit before um, through a presentation with the CGBG Colorado Green Building Guild, the fire wise home principles. I'll go through that pretty quickly. And then carbon and housing and why, why we need to focus on carbon, uh, the carbon situation and the buildings that we build and inhabit. And then finally, uh, Passive House and an overview both on quickly on what it is and the process behind it. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to put that in the context is that uh, Excel is offering a $37,500 rebate um, for the rebuilding effort uh, if you have a certified Passive House. And then there's lower tiers for Energy Star. Uh, the DOE has their zero energy ready home and an energy star. Um, but as you can tell, there's there's a there's a quite a bit of delta between an energy star home and a passive house home for what Excel is offering in the rebates. And I'll go into the reasons why um, Excel's interested in seeing us um, go well above and beyond code for buildings um, uh, within within their uh, service area. Um, quickly, uh, the idea of a firewise home, there's some background actually. After the Oakland firestorm, they did some research and they started um, incorporating um, uh, stronger fire codes um, throughout uh, California and throughout the country actually. And they found a direct, uh, a direct causal uh, effect on upping the uh, fire resilience of building design and the amount of buildings actually burned in fire events. Um, so, so there's a there's kind of a there's there's quite a bit of uh, information now about uh, the impact of fire resiliency in building design. And the way I like to kind of frame or frame it from from the beginning point of view is if you ever tried to make a campfire, for instance, uh, you always want to start with a lot of sticks. You don't want to start with a big log. And um, it's somewhat similar to how we want to think about designing a home. We want to think a little bit more like a log than a bundle of sticks when a fire event happens near us. Um, uh, we can start with the idea of the, the shape. Obviously, uh, a bundle of sticks has a lot of kind of complexity to a lot of, lot of surface area, uh, places for a fire to uh, get into the uh, material itself. And, and spread from there from a small space to a much larger space. The way you, we start a campfire is very similar to how often a home can start on fire as well. So a uh, more simplified shape uh, in the design of the home is, is kind of interestingly, we call that form factors, interestingly one of the first places to look at fire resilient design. Um, secondly, uh, the idea of removing the wick uh, removing things that lead a fire to your house. Uh, big giant wooden decks, of course, are ubiquitous in Colorado for our lifestyle, but they are fantastic ways to uh, start a fire uh, from the deck and then spreading to the house. Uh, the same with goes with fences in landscapes like a juniper tree next to a house. And uh, the house I showed earlier, that porch, uh, the trees, all the vegetation around it, those are all kind of key factors on what uh, a fire can slowly creep into uh, into the structure of the home. Speaking of structure, um, surprisingly, there's a lot of gap 
within our houses. And a lot of those gaps are often through the roof. Code requires often a ventilated roof system. And that vent is the perfect place for embers to come in straight into your home, into your attic space and burn from the inside out. So um, uh, we, we really, really prefer the concept of a uh, attic space that is fully insulated. Um, there's a lot of building science around how to do that properly to keep it from creating other problems, but it's done successfully quite often. Um, so, so the first thing is to close your house off. And that also, of course, goes for crawl spaces, which are not quite as off, often occurring now, but are a big part of how far in embers get into a house. Um, when we have a large flame front, uh, amazingly, uh, the heat's enough to crack glass in a window. And when your window breaks, basically, it's like leaving the door open. You have full access to the house for uh, heat and embers and things. Again, the house starting on fire from the inside out. So um, now the fire resilient the house is a tempered glass triple pane uh, because uh, the, each glass can take some time in a heat event to crack. So you, you significantly improve the time for the heat event to occur before your glass fails. And the tempered glass is also uh, quite, is reinforced for uh, hot, heat events and that goes for the frame as well uh, aluminum clad frames wooden frames are typically better or insulated frames better than kind of cheap vinyl frames which don't support glass uh, of course obviously this is this is apparent but um but it's kind of hard to you know it's it's hard to wrap your head around sometimes when you're looking at the aesthetics of a house that uh Wrapping it in wood siding with wood roofs, which are often illegal now, even asphalt roofs are, are uh, somewhat susceptible, but especially uh, wooden elements on the house itself are certainly a no-no. There's quite a bit of fungible uh, types of materials that look like wood. They're, they're not wood exactly, of course, but you can use uh, fiber cements, which are extremely fire resilient, uh, metal roofs, um, tile roofs, uh, brick facades, uh, stucco, uh, especially if the stucco um, is on a substrate that's fire resilient, um, makes a huge difference when we have larger fire events. And then what you put in your walls is almost as important as what is on the outside of the walls. Uh, so for instance, foams, of course, are extremely fire, fire um, susceptible. Um, and that in unfortunately fiberglass is too. A fiberglass actually burns at a fairly relatively low rate and uh, more importantly it lets a lot of air through it so it provides oxygen into the wall cavity. Um, so that's why we often prefer to use something like a mineral wool board or a mineral wool bat which is extremely fire resilient um, used often in industry and even cellulose it's a treated recycled paper but um, it's, it doesn't hold flame very well, and it also doesn't uh, allow oxygen through the wall cavity. Uh, so that helps improve the fire resilience of the house. And then perhaps um, one of the most important things is the airtight uh, building. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But the first thing airtightness does, of course, is it keeps smoke out of the house. Uh, so it's a primary, a primary pr protection uh, when we turn into smoke particles. And with all the fire events we've been having over the years, having that control, that basic control layer between the outside dirty air and the air inside is absolutely critical. And then, the, and then we like to build tight and ventilate it right. You'll hopefully hear that a lot. If it's a builder with their salt, they know that by heart. And so we'd like to incorporate uh, ventilation systems uh, or heat recovery ventilation systems more specifically. Uh, within the buildings and preferably as dedicated systems, which can be balanced. Um, let's jump into kind of the whole kind of principle behind net zero and why, why it's important to look at the kind of environmental impact of buildings. Um, they basically take a significant chunk of what a building's total carbon is and it breaks down into two basic places, into the operation of the building, they call it, uh, which is means the energy it means to run the building, lighting, heating, cooling, 
water heating, things like that. And then of course the um, materials to go into the construction of the building in the first place. That is a absolutely massive uh, component of our overall climate impact. Um, the numbers vary between 40 and 50%. And here's an idea of how to visualize that situation is that um, on year one is how to, when you're rebuilding your home or building a building, um, your carbon impact is 100% in the materials that you select. And, uh, and that, that, you know, that 22% or let's say for the building itself, that's maybe 40% of the total building's carbon footprint over its lifetime is just in that first year materials choices and design choices of the building. And the rest goes into the energy. And, um, you know, unfortunately, we'd love to project into the future, put it on our future scopes and think that in 2050, all energy is going to be carbon neutral. Um, that may or may not be the case, but right now it's it's definitely not the case, not for the next, uh, probably for a 15 year mortgage, it's probably going to be often uh, carbon intensive, uh, especially when you need energy the most. And that's going to be at nighttime uh, when you're heating the building uh, or, or the peak summer when you're trying to cool the building, when we're stressing our energy sources the most. So think of uh, the energy slowly catching up with the carbon impact over time. Even if it becomes less over time, at the very beginning especially, it's a significant part of the carbon uh, question. Uh, that includes putting solar panels on your house and batteries, all that stuff. That doesn't actually solve this problem yet, uh, which is the net zero problem. So let's jump into energy. Um, so kind of the first obvious thing is to eliminate fossil fuels on site. Um, that means that you're going to you're going to want to um, eliminate uh, natural gas lines on site. Uh, there's a bit of controversy in conversation about what that means now, especially with building codes. Uh, it's happening nationwide quite quickly. Um, this is actually, I, I'm not quite sure why people are worried about this. Uh, this actually saves money, both in the construction and the operation of the home. So this is a money saver just from the, uh, from, just from the beginning to having a gas line to your house uh, due to uh, the fantastic quality of equipment now that we can use to heat a home and to cook with, things like that. Um, but natural gas is also used at something called peaker plants. And I learned a lot about this in NCRES over the years, is that um, we, uh, we need still a lot of natural gas to replace coal uh, because we need um, a lot of energy when uh, the wind doesn't necessarily supplement it, when the sun's not shining. And that's the cold hard truth on the actual energy use of buildings. So we need to keep that in mind when we're designing, especially around the concept of net zero. We should really not be talking about net zero building, but net zero carbon building. That's a kind of a more robust framework uh, to start from. So that starts with um, the heating, cooling, uh, using heat pumps, hot water, using hot water heat pumps, which are fantastically affordable and very effective now. Um, and then cooking often is used with inductive coat cook stove, cook tops, which are becoming extremely uh, popular. A lot of uh, great feedback from my clients and a lot of people in general on the inductive cook, cook stove uh, technologies. So, um, and then of course, on um, producing energy, uh, making roofs that actually can support PV rather than complex build, building roof systems. We had simplified roof systems, at least in the south side, where we can put a, put a PV system on. And then side, and then of course, we're going to be plugging cars into our houses. So that's another load. Now we expect transportation to be uh, to be converted into electrical use and then uh, house uh, battery storage. So um, there's going to be an extremely significant load on PVs in the future beyond just traditional uses for energy within the house. But uh, to be honest, when you're building a neighborhood, a community, uh, trees are better. Um, in that sense, I would take a tree over a PV system on my roof. And part of the reason is I can put that PV in a different place. I can put that PV making electrons on the other side of the state. And it's basically the same capacity of solar um, for me to use. Um, so it has the same impact. But in my neighborhood, um, 
I have a more biodiverse and accessible green neighborhood uh, as a result. So don't think the PV is the panacea necessarily to the net zero. Trees are fantastic. They the heat island effect, they reduce, they create, of course, uh, uh, more favorable living conditions for not just us, but for lots of species. Um, so the mechanical side, the air source heat pumps, I went into a little bit. Um, almost all of you will probably be uh, looking at air source heat pump technologies for your space conditioning. It can be quite complex. Um, there's air source and ground source heat pumps. Uh, typically, ground source heat pumps are quite a bit more expensive, uh, but they do provide some options for hydronic heating, uh, where air source heat pumps are typically uh, blowers going over a coil, for instance. Uh, but you're looking at quite a bit difference in pricing. Um, but as far as efficiency, they can be quite similar. Uh, unfortunately, that information is hard to get now. Uh, but typically, what we're finding is that air source and ground source heat pumps uh, for single families are very, very uh, on par with each other at the end of the day for energy consumption. Sizing to loads are critical. So you definitely need all the equipment to be properly designed for the load. And the more lower the load, the easier it is to size that equipment for that load. We see significant energy losses from heat pumps that are too large for the building. Um, you can, because once they ramp down to 20%, they, their efficiency drops precipitously. And we actually don't even, uh, vendors do not have to label what their uh, equipment runs at you know, around 50% or 20%. They only have to give you their 100% label for its efficiency. So be aware of that. And then at matching your energy consumption with renewables. And for instance, a fantastic idea is heating water when your solar panels are at peak production. We actually are, create, we have equipment now we can program them so that we can use energy when it's best, uh, fully utilized, like uh, charging your car, heating your water. Um, the embodied carbon side, um, this is this is a little more nuanced and complex and, and very much an emerging part of what um, net carbon zero buildings is now. Uh, quite a bit of efforts going into kind of wrapping our heads around this and how to design for this. Uh, for, for one thing, concrete is certainly the world's largest single source of uh, CO2 emissions. Um, there's estimates are between five and 8%. But, but car, concrete, the use of concrete in cement in particular, out, far outstrips almost any other uh, single uh, use of carbon uh, within uh, human, the scope of human uh, construction or development. Uh, other things like steels and coppers and aluminums, uh, foam uh, has embedded carbon, but also has a uh, has blowing agents uh, that can. HFCs or CFCs that uh, are greenhouse gas, very powerful greenhouse gases. Um, complex for heating equipment, for heating and cooling, can be very uh, energy intensive in its construction, it also uses CFCs. Solar energy and storage, here's kind of some bad news, guys. Solar electric panels take a lot of CO2 to produce, and um, for their lifespan, they, they need to be replaced every 20 to 30 years. It's an ongoing situation for the embodied carbon. And we put that in our calculations for embodied carbon effect. Um, I did actually talk uh, for this group um, a few months ago talking about the embodied carbon of a project that I was developing uh, for Los Angeles. And then refrigerants, uh, I went over a little bit. And then there's lots and lots of um, kind of more optimized uh, carbon if not positive, at least neutral materials. Um, when it comes to insulation specifically, um, that's that's a big one. Uh, we're, we're looking at like on the cost effectiveness of cellulose, it's also almost carbon neutral. Um, wool insulations are a little bit more, uh, hemp creek can be a carbon positive. It's a little, or, or hemp in particular. Um, wood fiber, they all kind of run on the lower side. Um, we also look at uh, timber. Uh, especially uh, when we're placing concrete and things like that, um, looking at wood framing, both light wood framing and something we call mass timber. Maybe not something specific for residential construction, but uh, a big part of that a carbon material side of things. And I'll show you one of my favorite materials and something that I've been using. Um, 
I'll be uh, I'll be using this on a couple of Passwash projects I'm building up here in the foothills. Um, Neko cocoon panel. It's made out of straw, and on the outside they put a wood fiber insulation. On the inside, a plaster, and they can plaster both sides of that. And uh, the first thing is like people often ask, well, that obviously that's going to burn. Duh, it's straw, right? So uh, actually, uh, the straw burns well after the timber in the building in the frame burns and the timber doesn't burn very readily with the plaster on top of it. In fact, this is one of the safest constructions for fire because of the reduction in um, in oxygen and also because most of straw is silica. So without oxygen, without actually that much uh, actual active materials to burn, it's 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 quite uh, resilient uh, and throw a hay bale on a fire and it's going to take a long time to burn compared to almost every other log on that fire, for instance. Now I'm going to jump into switching tracks uh, into the Passau standard. And I'm going to focus a little bit on this uh, and hope that you would consider it um, in your thinking about uh, the opportunity to rebuild, especially take advantage of that extraordinary rebate. And I'll do a quick overview of that and the people who are involved in that. So uh, just to get to help, kind of gets you guys aligned to what it is and how it works. And the reason why Excel is particularly enthusiastic about putting this kind of uh, effort and financial backing into Passive House Standard is it's it's been proven to be the most rigorous uh, energy standard around the world. And um, and it's 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 uh, done that uh, through through um, a through good physics, uh, good QA quality assurance standard, and it's been around for quite a quite a long time now. And just a note, it's not passive solar house. Somebody just wrote an article for I think the Colorado Sun saying that there's this amazing great rebate for passive solar houses. Passive house is actually passive buildings in German, um, so it's not just for houses. And the passive part is um, meaning that a building that uses very little no or no energy. Um, it's been around for a long time. Uh, there's been traditions from Iceland, uh, one of the first buildings to really, uh, Iceland to China to uh, an Arctic ship. There's quite a tradition uh, of projects that inspired the beginning of it by Wolfgang Feist and Bo Adam Adamson, the people who began this process, including uh, Emery Lovin's house uh, up in uh, Snowmax in Colorado. It was one of the early examples of the some of the principles around Passive House. Uh, Saskatchewan, Harold Orr in Saskatchewan House uh, was one of the first buildings to look at uh, the idea of super insulated, uh, airtight building design in cold climates. And the first kind of official Passive House was a four-unit uh, four building in uh, Germany built by Wolfgang Feist, Dr. Feist. But Passive House has been built all around the world at all different kinds of scales. And it, um, so it's been proven out um, quite, quite a long time. First Passive House is, I think, 27 years old now. Um, the first Passive House I visited is uh, the one at the upper left hand side uh, by Need Base, Jonah Stanford. Uh, that's in um, Santa Fe. That was completed, ooh, I don't know, maybe 13, 14 years ago. Um, and it's a fantastic example of what you can do in high cold climate like ours. I built mine. Uh, mine was certified maybe seven years ago. And uh, I turn on the heat maybe four or five times a year, to be honest. So why is it a big deal, basically, or how does it work? It's a thermal battery, essentially. So we talked about chemical batteries, uh, solar, active solar storage batteries, things like that. Well, this is like a passive thermal battery. So think of a, a day when it's sunny and cold outside here in Colorado, and then at nighttime, what we can do is just store that heat. We don't store the heat with complex kind of thermal mass equipment. And other things we use, what we do is we do the same principle as a puffer jacket or a good thermos. We we simply insulate it extremely well. Yeah, that's it's easier said than done. There's a lot of physics and a lot of design goes into it, but it's the 21st century concept of how high performance buildings work. Uh, it's a little bit less tech, uh, certainly very, very little or zero carbon involved, 
um, and much more based on the ideas of the physics of a building. It starts with the thermal envelope. Uh, I'm sure lots of you can imagine we, we do have to use lots of insulation. High performance windows. Windows are kind of one of the, uh, they're the main energy source of the building in terms of energy gains, but also could be energy losses of the building, the main source of energy loss for a building. Thermal bridges. These are not bridges that we drive over. These are ways that energy can escape through uh, through materials that go through the building that conduct heat that can add up substantially. Airtight building envelope. Uh, so, so not only is airtightness excellent uh, for air quality, it's also really good for energy savings. In fact, that's one of the top three uh, criteria for air, for passive house. And then of course we put in uh, fresh air systems. And what we do is we exchange the heat with the building um, so that you're not losing very much heat while you're getting continuous fresh air uh, extracted and placed in the building, depending on where you need it. Um, the, the link kind of fell to the side, but uh, in Australia, they had been going through um, a lot of devastating brush fires. I'm sure you've heard in the news a long time, and they've been struggling about how to deal with it. So when it comes, especially with air tightness, uh, they really... Um, started really adopting the passive house strategies for air tightness in particular. Um, and so we're starting to see kind of these multiple high, multiple uh, positive reinforcing effects through the just the air tightness side of buildings. Um, certification. So uh, in terms of getting that rebate, you need a certified passive house. So there's different certifications. Uh, we usually start with the classic, which is, we call it classic. This is kind of what uh, Passmail started was this, this uh, energy usage and is measured per square foot. And then they added a couple more criteria. Basically the plus would be what we call a net zero building now, uh, but it's net zero based on the time of use of energy. So it matches your energy usage um, more from a monthly or a weekly basis rather than annual basis. So you can't just make a bunch of energy in the summertime and think that you can somehow make up for it in the winter. That's not how electrons work. Um, so this is being a little more realistic on that. And then there's an, a kind of an energy positive house. So you're feeding your neighbors the energy as well, or maybe your automobiles, whatever else you need outside of the function of the building itself. That's the premium standard. Uh, and it starts with using something called the Passive House Planning Package or the PHPBP. And that's a, a fantastic, what we call a dynamic or parametric spreadsheet. So um, it's, a, it's a process of um, performance design. So every decision we make in the building, we understand immediately how we lose or gain energy from those decisions. And it goes from insulation to orientation something called we, the form factor or the shape of the building to the placement of the windows, the types of windows, the list goes on and on, is extremely detailed and quite rigorous. And this is usually where we start good uh, passive house design. We don't do this after we design the house. We do this during, at the very beginning of the building process, building design process for successful outcomes for certification. And then so um, a big part of that certification is also reliance on qualified people through the team. So it's quite a bit of training for Passive House uh, from a designer's training. There's also a builder's training or what they call tradesperson's training uh, that's run by EMU Systems here in Colorado. And they just wrapped something up in Fort Collins, in fact. Um, uh, and then there's a um, certifier and that's the person, that's the QA agent, that's the quality assurance person who overviews this and interacts with the Passive House Institute to make sure that we are doing what we say we do. Uh, and that's a big part of why a lot of earlier buildings failed was that people said they, the buildings would be built this way, but they weren't in real life. And you ended up getting handed something that didn't do what it claimed it did. So we need to change that. And then finally, there's something called a certified component. Uh, so there's things that we put in the Passive House it's the same thing. The, the component itself does what it says it does as far as energy uh, on the label. And it's, and it's tested uh, through protocols by the Passive House Institute. 
So um, quickly, I'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, so uh, it starts with the architect or the designer, and there's the certification. Uh, you can be a certified uh, uh, professional in that sense. And what they're doing is they're basically, they're keeping the passive house process first and foremost within the design process. So they're looking out for all the elements of uh, passive house performance. Um, they may or may not be doing the energy modeling themselves, but they're in charge of the air tightness, the insulation, the window specifications, the way the air tightness is implemented, uh, uh, quite all those other parts. While they're designing what the house is, both um, structurally, um, uh, aesthetically, uh, functionally, uh, um, from the budget point of view. So all these things need to be merged, merged uh, by this person. Uh, often the best outcomes are by somebody who is also uh, somebody who does the energy modeling themselves. Passive house team, the consultant, uh, you can bring in a consultant and they, they work with the architect. Uh, some architects, even as um, uh, certified um, designers, would love to have consultants working with them. Uh, that helps that process tremendously and speeds it up and helps provide a second set of eyes and thinking uh, on the optimization of the passive house within the project. Um, and the, basically the idea is that you're specifying the ventilation envelope and window systems and you're optimizing the building over time. So it's so it makes sense from a building point of view and a budget point of view. And then you, you're also doing the heading the documentation of the construction of it and submitting that documentation uh, to the certifier. And the certifier will work with the, with the consultant uh, in terms of making sure everything's done what's said it's done and uh, being tested properly and uh, working and making sure the institute will accept it. And then there's the owner. The owner should actually be the first person. That's the first team member. Um, and they're the, obviously the core, core stakeholder and how the building goes together. So, so their so their efforts critical in making sure that um, uh, supports being reached and, and properly uh, developed throughout the entire building process, uh, especially around lots of decisions, uh, core decisions uh, that have to be made through the building process. So it can be quite an active process. Uh, in some sense. So I find often that the people I, I'm working on, I don't know, about seven or eight projects now, and I find often the owners are extremely active in understanding why we're doing it and how we're doing it. So um, they know what what they're spending money and time on. And then uh, the builder. The builder is the implementer of the building, and that's the certified passive house tradesperson. Uh, and what they're doing is they're they're obviously uh, they're they're somewhat at, um, what we call design development. So they're going to be made, helping uh, make calls on the constructability of the plans, making sure that the, the makes sense in the real world. Um, they're the ones who are going to be implementing the air tightness strategy, and we test the buildings. It's quite rigorous, so that's on them to make sure that the buildings are airtight. Um, and uh, they also are the ones who are kind of integrating and adopting and on-site, making sure that everybody knows and understands what passive house means and how to uh, keep keep it uh, thoroughly um, within the, con the conditions that were it was designed for. Andrew, if I might just jump in here, um, sure. where does the cost control happen? along all of these uh, team members and and stages of a build? So the cost control is everybody's responsibility. And, and that usually starts with the owner having a realistic budget and understanding what what things cost. So so you don't have kind of a, a, a poverty mentality at the beginning. You're trying to get too much out of everybody because you'll that usually leads to negative outcomes halfway through. And then um, certainly the designer is the person who knows what the scope is. So the designer will be um, making sure that it's right size so that so the building's not per square foot, supposedly, that that you get that they're you're getting the most amount of bang for your buck 
from the use of the building. So often you can make a smaller building uh, more cost effective than a larger building and still get as much actual use out of the building. Structural engineers, I didn't mention them, but they are a massive part of it and they coordinate very much with the um, with the building designers or so a more simplified building often is um, is uh, is an easier building to structurally design and to build. And then the builder themselves has to have kind of a good sense of sequencing and management of the building uh, process on both the construction or contractor side and the building side and understanding what that means and why they're there. So um, they don't try to skip out on certain things, which costs us a bundle afterwards, especially around things like air tightness. Um, and I mean, that's that's there's there's a lot of rabbit holes around costs right now, and I know a lot of people want to know how much it costs. Um, I can't tell you right now, um, hard hard numbers, and you know, we should jump into that later. Um, when we finish the slideshow. I'd love to. If that's okay. So is that is that good for now? Because I'm going to go into what um, kind of the uh, process of getting the building to work properly. And in cost is like you're not going to get your 37 500 bucks if you don't get certified. So uh, trying to trying to do all these things on the cheap, you're not you're going to end up not getting certified, which is the whole point of this process, and this is why Excel wants us to, you know, they're, they're, they see this as an investment, not as a cost. And I think maybe that's the, the way we need to frame this conversation is in terms of this investments and paybacks, um, both simple paybacks and long-term paybacks, both in quality and health and energy or reduction. Um, so, so it's a very complicated question on the cost side. And then taste, what kind of, how big a building you want? What do you want to look like finishes? Most, almost all the costs have nothing to do with passive house at the end of the day. And that's what's kind of frustrating when we hear about people saying green costs more. Actually bad design costs much more than green. Bad structural design costs much more. A incompetent contractor costs more. A owner who has unrealistic expectations or would prefer to have a $10,000 tub than a high performance uh, window package that costs more. So we got to keep all these things kind of within that realm of conversations when it co comes to cost and quote unquote green building. Out of I know that's a strong opinion, but I think that's kind of I think that should be part of how we frame it uh, personally. Um, I, I'll go quickly. I don't have too much more to go. Um, appreciate you guys' patience on this. Um, so. Part of the building in at the end of the day we also have to do blower door tests so we're going to make sure that the building's air tightness is where it, it should be uh, it's at 0 0.60 air changes per hour is what the passive house standard calls for we usually do that a couple times during the building at least during mid construction uh like code as you test the building after you built it well when was the last time you tested the building after you completed it um, it doesn't make any sense. You should be able to test it while you're building the building to make sure that it works the way you designed it and intended to work. So that's part of this process. Um, and then the balancing for the energy recovery ventilation. Uh, if these things fail, people become very uncomfortable. They can be quite loud and it's important for the warranty. So we need to balance that and report that uh, for certification. And there's specialty consultants often, it's a more complex building uh around uh, that thermal loss for instance or air tightness strategies things like that um uh woofy there's there can be you know, for more expensive buildings more complex buildings we definitely want to bring in people who can uh, troubleshoot very specific issues that could come up and come up with great uh design solutions at the right time and then there's your best of house certifier and uh and this is this is a uh, not an exact representation of a certifier, but they can be pretty scary. They're the ones who are going to tell you if you're doing it right or wrong. And a good certifier will be telling, will be, will be acting as a um, kind of a um, a uh, bridge 
for the designer, the consultant through the process, almost for a consultant for the consultant in a sense. They'll be supporting that process to make sure that uh, the designer and the and certifier, the, the consultant and the designer are uh, making sure they get everything properly developed in their design and at the construction side. And this is the person who's interfacing with uh, the Passive House Institute for the actual certification, making sure that the way the building was designed and constructed matches the way the building uh, was energy modeled and um, and the blueprints, for instance, making sure that everything's covered. So um, they're a critical part of that team as well, especially for final certification. And then the components, um, not necessary that you get a certified component, but it's extremely helpful, especially when we talk about the ventilation systems. You get penalized quite heavily if you do not use a certified uh, ERV or HRV. Um, for other systems, it's really nice to have like a wall panel that's certified, and we understand a window that's certified. Uh, in fact, uh, there's we have a certified window that's made uh, in Boulder County by Alpen, Alpen Systems. Um, that's a certified uh, window for Passive House, which is extremely helpful in the process. And then I think this is my last slide. Uh, and I'll go super quick through this. I know it's a lot, but I just kind of the summary of why we want to do this. A kind of the most important thing is that there's too many eco buildings. So we'll throw up these energy star buildings or these lead buildings, and they say these are green buildings, but at the end of the day, uh, they often end up being uncomfortable because they're not looking specifically at the thermal dynamics of the building, which is what leads to comfort. I didn't get into the comfort, the comfort side of it tonight in the in the quality of living inside of Passive House. It's quite outstanding, and it's about 50% of why Passive Houses are so popular. It's not just, actually, I'd say much larger than that. It's more like 70% of why people feel Passive Houses is for the comfort, sound quality, thermal, thermal lack of differentiating, very even temperature, good sound through the building. Um, you can't really do that if you just swap out equipment for more efficient equipment, or just do kind of one small step at a time. It's an integrated process, and those are in the outcomes show. So it eliminates what we call that performance gap. Uh, healthy indoor air, indoor air quality, so fresh air all the time, attracting air often from the kitchens, from the, bat, from the um, bathrooms 100% of the time. Put it providing fresh air into the to living spaces, especially bedrooms, uh, and then fire events. Uh, we can filter and control air um, during the wildfire season, uh, especially um, during ozone events. Things like that. Uh, air quality is, is a significant problem with the front range, as we know. The more durable and resilient, um, uh, especially power outages. If the power goes out, um, your heat you don't need heat immediately. Your your building can sit on idle for days typically uh, without supplemental heat needed. Um, the physics-based feedback, that's an important part of this is physics-based, so we can't cheat physics. That's uh, elemental, there's no, there's no way around it. You, you're using that first and foremost as a guiding principle. And then when we talk about components or design or all these other things, they're based on the physics process of design. Um, it works as I showed with almost all building types in all places. You know, I wanna really emphasize that Colorado, um, we're in a unique position that Passive House, especially in the front range, is one of the easiest places on the planet to uh, design for, um, especially if you have good solar gains, because that's the free heat. Um, uh, in Germany, it's harder to build a Passive House. In Seattle, it's harder to build a Passive House. Um, uh, in a hot desert, it can be harder to build a passive house in some ways compared to what their regional basic codes are. And there's been a lot of talk about, oh, it's hard be because it's not, it's a German standard. It's, it's a physics standard and those physics are universal. Turns out that the physics in Colorado uh, baseline with our code works exceptionally well with good passive house design in terms of uh, the, the outcomes compared to the cost of building one. And it's a true net, net zero. So when you're producing energy, you're producing energy on the building that's used specifically for the building at the right time. So as I said, when you're 
making solar electricity, you can make hot water with that. You don't need um, a giant battery bank, for instance, to run your, your large heat pump at night uh, when it's really cold outside. And often you actually don't run off batteries, of course, at night, realistically. You're running off natural gas beaker plants or even worse coal for now. So this is a true net zero carbon construction outcome uh, using uh, right-sized uh, PV and right-sized uh, storage systems. And this cost-effective the construction operation, and that's uh, probably where I think a lot of our conversation is probably going head to tonight. And, I, and we can take a deeper dive into that. And with that, I'll just leave kind of this resources slide. Uh, my contact information is at the bottom. These are kind of the national organizations and the CGBG. And uh, if, if you're interested more in um, the trainings or things like that, especially if you're interested in training yourself, uh, there's there's online courses now offered by the North American, I'm sorry, we call it the Passive House, North American Passive House Network. They just changed their name to the Passive House Network online courses. And of course, uh, I'm part of the Passive House Rocky Mountains group. So with that, um, we want to get into some, some Q&A. Hopefully I stirred some opinions and questions up. It'd be fun to jump into. Okay, so I got a couple of questions in here. Uh, the first one is from John Bleem, and he asks, is there any land available to do larger community solar systems in or near the affected areas to help support net zero from a community level? The larger system could significantly enhance cost effectiveness. And I've already answered that in the chat. Uh, uh, partially, I don't know all the information, but one of the uh, community solar providers in the area stepped up and said they would support something like this. Uh, do you happen to know more? Uh, well, let me, let me, I don't know more, but I, I do know that that is optimal for two reasons. And the first reason is, um, for, first and foremost, we should be building our homes or neighborhoods uh, primarily for humans and other uh, species. So creating a tree, treed, treed place, not overly optimizing roofs just to be power plants is great. Um, and the second reason is, and I think the question, the person who asked the question was spot on, they're more efficient because people are watching these solar panels. Um, they're getting optimized for sun. Uh, sometimes they can even put trackers on them to optimize the at least uh, single axis trackers. Um, so um, solar gardens are often used for communities. So even maybe developing a park with shading structures that could uh, utilize and optimize. Uh, churches or other large buildings can be uh, optimized, those rooftops as well. We have a ton of parking lot that can be optimized uh, with solar electricity. So we should think of solar kind of more as a community asset rather than just something we have to put on our roofs. This is kind of my personal opinion. Yeah, and uh, uh, Doug Porter also chimed in on that uh, uh, question and he says, if we're looking at the Marshall fire victims, why not consider reorienting roof lines to optimize solar gain and PV production and use organic solutions like tree planting in locations around the buildings where it will not adversely affect uh, PV production. Uh, so that's right along uh, your lines of thinking, I, I would say. Uh, but it also contains another element that I want to lift up here. Um, one of the earliest uh, laws in human civilization um, was about solar gain. In Mesopotamia, they had laws that you could not shade your neighbor's um, um, uh, agricultural fields, uh, for yeah. instance. And um, yeah. in the United States, these laws have, have become forgotten, but may have to be reintroduced. Well, if you go into Japan, especially you look at a city like Tokyo or uh, Osaka or uh, Kyoto, any of their large cities, you often find that many of the buildings have sloped roofs in a very specific orientation direction because there's a daylight access laws, for instance. Um, 
uh, when we're talking about building density, uh, I don't think that we should optimize for solar. We should optimize for better building inhabitant outcomes. And if solar can be a part of that, we should optimize for daylighting, um, form factors, other things. I don't. I think solar should not drive the design process. Solar energy systems on roofs. Uh, I know this is Caro Renewable Energy Society. We've seen uh, net zero kind of outcomes for buildings that looked ridiculous because they were trying to just make as much roof top as possible for solar electric and the rest of the building design process probably suffered as a result as far as optimization for costs and usefulness. I have two questions here. One is from Shreeli Thompson. She asks, what are good alternatives to foam ICFs or foam filled SIPs? Uh, how do they compare cost-wise? And you'll need to explain those two acronyms, uh, ICFs and SIPs. Yeah, insulated concrete forms are basically uh, foam panels, usually EPS or something else, uh, with with a spacer in the middle uh, that also holds a rebar, and you basically build them like literally like Lego blocks and then fill it with concrete. Um, the ICF companies, I'm going to warn you, uh, just from my experience, they make uh, statements about the total R value of, the, of their wall systems that are flat out usually incorrect. So you can only use the foam insulation uh, part of that, and maybe a little bit for the concrete for the real R values. And then SIPs are structural insulated panels and they're foam panels. And they're popular because they are off-site and they can be built, they assembled on-site as a as a panelized system um, we don't see them very much they're kind of coming out of favor especially in the passive house community we're finding that our walls just need more insulation than a typical sip needs uh, so um, and then there's the fire fire problem so um, i have a colorado springs project that's uh, going to be a fire um, fire a resilient building and we're using uh, a company called Collective Carpentry out of Invermore, BC, Canada. It's making panelized systems for the roof and the walls. They'll be erected for this project. Um, there's a number of companies. There's a company called Phoenix House in, in, out in um, Grand Junction. Uh, another company uh, down in um, in New Mexico, uh, B Public, also makes panels. And then I'm using these straw panels. So there, there's quite a few alternative systems that are foam-free, high-performance walls that kind of, kind of do all these things I was talking about in a very integrated way. So we're not so, and also kind of carbon, low carbon or carbon neutral way, and also in a fire uh, resilient way. Okay. And I'm happy to share more information. Uh, you can contact me directly. Um, actually, um, I, I'm just uh, looking for this question now because it fits in nicely here uh, about modular passive homes and whether they could be a less expensive alternative, asks someone here, Louis van der Kooy. And yeah. uh, similarly, uh, the other question here is, are there any plans for partial batch designs for the core passive house design for these? Partial batch designs, what, what do you think, what does that mean? I'm interested, um, quite sure. I'm not quite sure myself. What I'll do is I'll follow up with the first part and then uh, if the questioner wants to follow up on what batch meaning. So um, yeah, so I think like, uh, my all my projects are are almost i have three projects that are in fire burned areas and in wildlands and they're all going to be panelized um principally because it's definitely cheaper in um rural settings rather than having a crew come onto the job site uh framing insulation air tightness all that that can take two to three months we can we can get a building erected uh with um in three or four days um on site so that so that in itself saves quite a bit of money um the actual cost savings from a labor and material standpoint um it depends on who's who your supplier is for your panels it could either be almost exactly the same 
as uh, site built or more expensive or twice as expensive. So uh, that that's not there's no hundred percent answer for that. I found collective carbon. But I, I would I would throw in at this point that you're essentially de-risking your entire build because m many projects are held up by bad weather or or, or lack of or, or workers don't show up uh, stuff yeah. like that. Obviously, yeah. if you can build the house itself in four days or a week you have a lot less of these risks to deal with yeah and we should call it drying it in because that's the basically we're weatherproofing the house at that point um yeah and there's a quality um thing uh you know i mean honestly weather it's amazing colorado you guys drive anywhere they'll build in any kind of weather so your lumber will be soaking freaking wet when they put your wall up or when they build your platform and then they'll put the roof on when they put the roof on. So you're not guaranteed a dry quality building. Um, and then there's the QA, there's the point, especially around the airtitis of having a experienced crew uh, putting all those assembly factors together so that you don't have to um, train somebody on site. The construction management's a little bit easier. So overall, especially when there's a lot of demand for passive house, I'd say offsite penalization systems are probably the way to go um, if we look at the overall cost assessment and then the quality side of it for certification. So, um, and f um, for that second part, mm -hmm. I've just tried to unmute uh, Carmen Azaredi. So, Great. if you wanted to chime in, you could do so now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was just asking because I did a certified passive house consultant course a while ago, and I know that there's no way that you could have like a cookie cutter style design that would work, you know, 10 miles away. But because we're talking about such a small area, is there a potential of doing like a batch of north facing designs and a batch of south facing designs or west facing designs? with a group of designers in the area so that the victims could access kind of the basics of how to build that were designed by a group of people together. Because the design Carmen, is a significant part of it. Yeah, I, I love that thinking. And I think that's what we need to investigate. We just had a meeting, uh, we, had a, we had a Passive House meeting yesterday um, on how to kind of, work around this framework so we had the head of passive house network um we had one of the principals of the certifiers organization and and what we're trying to do is there's probably not a cookie cookie cutter way there actually potentially could be but the certifier who's extremely experienced um feels that since we're it's all in the same exact area that um and with a lot of similar orientation things as you're talking about, um, although these cul-de-sacs, you know, they go every which way, uh, that there's the potential that there's a, a way to at least optimize a semi-custom passive house design process. So even though it won't be a cookie cutter design, it won't be like a fully have to be flushed out, uh, bespoke PHPP, passive house planning package either and that that can be shared amongst residents during the design process. Uh, more more to come. And if you want to, um, I'd love to follow up with you if you um, have some insights onto how to uh, roll something like that out. Yeah, I'll send you an email. That'd be great. And I, and I think that's exactly the kind of thinking we, we would love to um, see prosper. This, this has to be successful, right? If if people try to build these things and they don't succeed, it's going to be bad for them. It's going to be bad for Passive House. It's not going to be good for Excel either uh, in the long run. So the more ideas, the better. And I just want to add that I heard about uh, Phoenix House in Grand Junction. Uh, Cress actually, the southeastern chapter of Cress, did a webinar with them in December, and that is now up on our website. So I encourage people to look at that. And one little caveat, they just built a new factory there. Uh, Phoenix House is one of those uh, companies that build modular wall sections that can then be assembled um, to Passive House standards. 
but I also heard that they're they're booked out into 2024, uh, yeah. even with new factory, because it is a con concept that uh, has convinced quite a few people that this is the way to go. And now I have a a, a materials and technical question here: Are mini split heat pumps a good way to go in Colorado? Uh, this person has heard that in this zone, above ground heat pumps can be problematic. Total, complete, unfortunately, nonsense that we still have to to defend um, air source heat pumps. Heat pumps are rated down to, um, in fact, there's an excellent uh, article I shared uh, with another group. Um, just going through it, like Mitsubishi will guarantee something like 70% efficiency down to like minus five degrees for their source heat pumps, for the H2 heat pumps. Um, air source heat pumps are extremely resilient. Uh, the worst you're going to get is a COP of one. Um, I, it, But I will caveat that Colorado Springs would not let me do a heat pump for my passive house because they said it got so cold from the last frost that people who put in heat pumps in existing houses, they couldn't keep the houses warm. Now, a really poor, poor, poorly a leaky house that loses a lot of heat uh, during minus 15 degree weather, the heat pump's not going to keep up with that. Um, and so they required us to put electrical resistance in. And of course, the utility doesn't want to see electrical resistant heat. And so there's a lot of confusion out there. So uh, right sizing heat pumps is critical. Um, having good envelope design is critical, um, especially when there's when it gets very cold. But air source heat pumps are extremely uh, robust in uh, low temperature conditions for a new construction. Um yeah, I'm jumping uh, around here in the Q&A a bit, and I'm uh, going to take Norbert Klebel's uh, question next. He asks, can you speak to the substantially lower operational cost of net zero homes? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, net zero. Um, the I operational mean, uh, cost. We have to clarify here. We, 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 yeah, yeah. In our announcement, we talked about um, not just passive homes, we actually had the term net zero homes. Uh. Sure, and I'm going to say there's no such thing as a net zero home uh, in that sense, an energy sense. L let's start with this definition. If you have gas to your home, it's not a net zero home, point blank, just can't be. Um, if it's an electrical home uh, for net metering, uh, I uh, it's possible definitely with like a seven, kilowatt array to run a energy efficient home as a net zero home annually um, on from a cost point of view. Um, here's kind of, I, unfortunately, I don't pay power bills. I've lived off grid for 25 years. So um, I've had to, I was forced to live with current battery technologies and solar electric technologies. So, so I would have to say universally, absolutely, it's completely possible. and quite simple uh, when you right size uh, your demand and match it with your solar potential. So. Okay. Um, uh, you, I have a qu question here from Ken Regelson that I think uh, he it would be best if he asked that question himself. And Ken, if you're, if you're on, uh, then please make yourself heard. Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Outstanding. Uh, thank you very much for this great talk, Andrew. There's a lot of information here and an awful lot of it I do agree with. Um, but uh, you said uh, quite a bit about um, air source heat pumps can do this, but also ground source heat pumps can do this. And you said they're much more expensive. I, yeah. I, I mean, I just have to tell you that I just got bids for ground source versus air source systems. With the exception of the loop, they were identical within 200 bucks and in terms of the cost. And this Wait, is retrofit. What was the cost of the system? Where source was the... versus ground source equipment and installation with the exception of the ground loop. And the ground loop is expensive, that's true, 
if you're doing the retrofit. I mean, if that's how. Retrofit, if you yeah. reduce the cost by going and doing it in a uh, new in a new setting, and particularly if you can stack up several houses together then you can drop the cost of the loop substantially. In addition, there's also gas utilities. Um, there are three of them now in the country. Uh, in the United States, they're doing pilot programs where they're actually doing providing the loop in the same fashion that they provide gas now on, yeah. a, on a fee basis. Um, so, so, uh, so, so I think, I think, I think what you want to say is that it can be more expensive and there are things that you can do about it. Um, but, but, but you included the cost. You didn't include the cost of the loop, and it's the drilling rig. I mean, we we just no. the got well. We you, we just got a bid in Denver for a five thousand dollars system or a twenty five thousand dollars system for the same capacity, and I think that's pretty typical from what we've been seeing. Um, you you for, have to go with economy of scale, and we have to be able to drive the price down. And the thing that you're not including in your calculation is the cost. You said you wanted to minimize peaking plants, and Colorado Springs is right. It doesn't stay minus five. It gets below that. And the Mitsubishi peak pumps, like all heat pumps by physics, have to pump, have to use an awful lot more energy at the same time that the houses are using an awful lot more energy. And that's that's a fundamental problem when everything stacks up at once. And in addition, during a cold snap, like it was minus 19 in places in Colorado, the sun wasn't shining and the wind wasn't blowing. So there wasn't that piece of the puzzle to help out. It would either well, be totally by storage or totally by backup generation. So just saying, you want to look well, at the entire me, picture. Well, so this is, this is what the entire picture is, is that this is why Excel Energy is giving this level of rebate for passive houses because our demand in that exact situation, that minus 10 degrees, which is quite rare, by the way, right? So we don't see that too often. Um, I'm not going to often use much energy, even in that condition. Uh, my, my entire heating system failed last year during that minus 20 degree um, thing because the water into my house froze the water line to my house so i didn't have hydronic heating working uh the house stayed got down to 59 degrees without any supplemental heat uh, so so overall the total heat demand is what we need to look at not the equipment demand but the total heat demand is what is how we optimize these buildings and then we right size the right equipment for it but if i'm if i'm going to drill a hole in the ground if i'm going to get better performing windows the optimization of the comfort of the occupants and the overall demand will probably be better spent on higher performing windows and air tightness than it would be for the ground source heat pump uh, on an individual house basis. Um, heat pumps do, uh, ground source heat pumps are used more often on larger demand projects and, and they make a lot of sense in that case. But um, I, I'm, I can't buy the, the heat pump it individually for an individual house is going to be more about the same price for ground source compared to air source at this point. So uh, Andrew, I, I think we'll uh, we'll switch directions here. Uh, a bunch more questions I want to get to, and one of them um, is why are developers and builders working actively against net zero? And well, that's back to the. So Oh, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Is that the whole question? So anytime, so so it doesn't actually net zero. Actually, weirdly, it doesn't have anything to do with this. Uh, historically, anytime there's been code advances and code adoption, uh, uh, large scale builders, production builders have fought it pretty much tooth and nail almost every iteration. From my experience, for the past 25 years, I've been in the business. So. Um, it's not really a green code thing. It's really basically uh, a, a code thing. And, and we shouldn't really even call it green code now. Um, code's kind of just catching up to current technologies and current building sciences. Um, it's unfortunate that like, we don't demand this of our car manufacturers or our food manufacturers. When's the last time we asked a food manufacturer to like reduce food safety? You know, it's it's it's. It's unfortunately ubiquitous in our particular industry. Um, 
a lot of people uh, have different opinions about that. On that note, I have another question that I want to bring in here. Um, it specifically asks, did Louisville or Superior require a passive house design standard or just a net zero, which is much easier to obtain uh, with the passive standard? Uh, could they or did they? I'm sorry. Uh, did, did, did they? What was actually no. in, in that? Uh, not proposal in those mandates. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 basically um, kind of a next step of what basic code will go to. So it's it's a um, it's basically integrating more specifically uh, de incentivizing um, energy consumption and incentivizing uh, renewable energies. But it, it's not a net zero energy standard by by that means. Um, there are places in the world that have adopted. Um, passive house um, as their building standard, uh, most famously Brussels. But if you're interested in that concept of um, kind of the, the way to scale these extremely high performance building standards into a code, uh, I recommend looking at the BC, British Columbia step code and the Vancouver building code and how they're approaching this. And basically what they're using is the passive house standard is kind of their final realized code. And the step part is that they're they're creating these four tiers to get up to that step code uh, per municipality over uh, a 10 or 15 year period. Um, so so one thing leads to another. That's kind of the nature of the code. It's a um, it's a progressive uh, what do they call kind of marginal process while passive house is kind of the end goal so to speak okay and at, at this point i just want to throw out something that i've heard in your circles a couple times about codes namely that a, a code is uh, the worst house you can build and still be legal it's a little less politely said than how you phrased it but i i think people should think about that um yeah you're not getting you're not getting the best when you built a code you're getting what they say you can't do worse than this or else we won't let you build it that's exactly how one way to approach it and it's hard to argue that and uh, the code build code code building is not necessarily cheaper it's just code right it's the least it's, it's the least illegal building you can build. Um, about that Excel incentive, um, uh, Mark Redpass asks, how much of the Excel incentive is eaten up by the certification cost for Passive House? And somebody else elsewhere also asked uh, how much uh, that certification cost is, and the implicit question is, um, do we really have to? <laughs> do we really have to um, well, certify? In, yeah, I mean, I, I, in these circles, I've often uh, heard people say, we're, we're trying to apply passive house principles, but we're yeah. too cheap to actually get it certified. It's not even cheap. It's um, and here's the other dirty secret, and this is why we have codes in the first place, is that um, you know, a lot of people say they're going to do something, but buildings are very tangible, bespoke individual things, and a lot of things can be uh, looked over uh, intentionally or unintentionally. You know, it's and then when you add something that's as precise as passive house, you have to have a lot of kind of people looking over each other to make sure. Like at the end of the day, it's built the way it's designed. Because when we make these extraordinary claims that it's going to use 80% less energy, especially at the dead of winter, when everybody else's heat pumps are going like crazy, my passive house heat pump just goes on for 15 minutes an hour or something while everybody else is running at 80, 90% capacity, that it actually does that. And, that's, and that has to be understood within the entire building design process and having somebody overviews it and checks it. So um, it keeps you honest to be, and especially when there's a lot happening, it's easy for everybody to get sidetracked. So having somebody who's really focused on that for the final certification 
And then Excel wants to know that they're giving you money for something they're getting, they're, they're, they're investing. This is an investment for them. And they're making sure through the certification that their investment's paying off uh, because of that historic uh, performance that they've seen from these types of buildings. Mm -hmm. oh, on that note, um, who is this? Again, Doug Porter asks, what sectors of the construction team need more extensive training to help achieve these energy efficient goals? I, I guess um, that's a good question. I I definitely think the more the better, uh, obviously, and, and I don't want to like, pigeonhole it, but a, a passive house fails typically in the design process from schematic to the design development side of it. So having a passive house consultant or um, designer um, would be absolutely critical. And I, and I say that is because um, you can't build something, you can't make something airtight if it's not designed detailed properly for airtightness. You could have a certified passive house builder who is extremely talented and extremely experienced, but they're handed a set of plans that are hard to detail. They'll be expensive or or possibly even fail in the field. Um, so, so that's kind of my take on it. Um, but honestly, having anybody on the team, having a cheerleader on the team, somebody who's willing to take that process on uh, at any scope and really learn it uh, and um, follow through with it um, is critical. So it's as much an attitude as it is uh, certification. I, I, I have a, a question myself here about the building style that we haven't dealt with yet. If you drive through the uh, suburban neighborhoods here, you see all this cookie cutter uh, style that is intricate and has lots of protruding windows and uh, second and third roof lines and all of that. Um, would you even be able to build to passive house standards um, if you wanted that particular look? Well, I, I, yes, you can. And this is this is kind of one of the crazy things. If you can afford it, it will be more expensive. It will be much more complicated and difficult. But most types of buildings can be certified, especially in Colorado. Um, in, but, but it really lays a lot of pressure on everybody to uh, make that work. Um, so and is we, that because uh, there are many more surfaces and edges, and is that the yeah. main reason? Well, it, because you can cheat it. You can add more insulation. Um, you can add more south-facing glazing. But at the end of the day, the the more simplified the form factor, the incredibly, the, the easier the house is uh, from an energy performance standpoint. And then, of course, the fire resilience standpoint. Um, I'm, I'm more of a contemporary designer myself, so I shy away from more complex uh, Baroque types of design. Um, you can fake it, too. You can put on a fake something on the roof. It doesn't necessarily have to be part of the thermal envelope too for looks. Uh, but uh, generally I try to shy away from complex forms. And and I'm gonna, this is Kirsten, I'm gonna jump in here really quick. We're bumping up against the end of um, 8.30. I wanna thank everybody, everybody. This has been awesome. And I wanna ask, uh, it, are there any questions, Martin? Cause you've been a, an amazing moderator that, that jump out that we, we'd like to address in the last couple minutes here. Uh, is there a question or two we can throw at Andrew, who's been working pretty hard here? Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, there's one question here I noted. Is the Excel incentive the first ever offered by utility for Passive House? I haven't heard of any and was a big gripe at a Passive House training course that energy efficiency was not well incentivized. Right, for the actual building itself. Um, 
this kind of this kind of money um the only other place that i've seen anything like this is in vancouver canada in the united states at least um yeah th this is exceptional um but there is there is a history to this excel has been actively um doing deep discounts for um mass saves which is the massachusetts utility for passive house in the terms of trainings things like that um uh i know in building codes we're finding it slipped in everywhere for passive house uh maybe some small finances like i think we are getting a rebate in colorado springs for a passive house it's like 2500 dollars um other places i know the denver is uh you get to go front and line for uh for a plan review if it's going to be a certified passive house but almost globally this is unprecedented okay from my knowledge at least uh tiffany boyd asks if fire victim property owners sell their lots to developers which is something that's happening Will the developer have to meet the 2021 IECC codes and the net zero appendix? That's beyond my understanding. Yeah, I know, okay. I know the big conversation right now. Um, um, I'm gonna put in that yeah. email that Kirsten is gonna send out a link to a document from the Louisville City Council that addresses this, but I'm, I don't have it at hand and cannot tell you with certainty so do we um, have a sense that superior and louisville are tracking in similar directions on this or are they very different in their approach you know i i think the answer to that andrew is i i think what would be great as a follow-up for the attendees here and uh possibly for a follow-up webinar would be uh to 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 tackle this uh, tomorrow and try and get everybody some links and some information that might be very relevant to what's going on in this conversation. I think that these are great questions and I, you know, none of us have the answers on hand, but I think there are links and there's, um, there are resources out there that we can put together. So let's put our heads together and send out a follow up email and, and get that out there. I, I'm really shocked. I think this really exposes the building industry quite bare. Um, I, we had, there's just a, uh, a um, kind of a, an expo last weekend um, and for, for fire victims and getting builders and information from builders, things like that. And uh, somebody walked around and asked, so what does a blower door cost? And they heard from $1,000 to $1,000. So, so to be honest, when people are throwing out these these numbers about what green building costs, uh, a lot of them are literally making things up or or throwing out numbers that are hard to quantify. Um, so, um, so right now, doubt is kind of one of the main things that we have to overcome, uh, and and think long term and think integrated. Uh, the passive house point of view, we're looking at lowering the lowering the overall need for building energy to the point where even if we use don't use a heat pump we could have a lower carbon building using just a just a cheap electric radiant heater than the most sophisticated heat pumps simply because we don't need the energy in the first place and on the cost side we need to build simpler houses that are more efficient in construction structurally um, that that are properly sized, um, sharing resources like maybe the ground source heat pumps, or even more importantly, why the single family home is like the one stop all. Can we do some alternative building types that people don't have to become, that people can buy into maybe in, in larger groups? So there's bigger questions to be asked than just like incremental energy codes, which really have no real cost basis on the true construction side of things so uh, you so just mentioned a hobby horse that i'm riding which is uh that house sizes and room sizes have totally ballooned over the last uh, two decades and now people are expecting ginormous homes uh as being normal 
but they're not and they're expensive to build so so my pitch would be basically to right size as you put it homes uh, build them smaller and then you can afford any of the uh, uh, measures that might be more expensive up front but will pay for it themselves uh, and you might still have this very same budget than you would have for a bloated house. <laughs> bloated house. It's, I mean, um, one man's bloated house is another man's uh, castle, I guess. Um, well, but you still have to vacuum it. Note, let, let's make sure that we we are <laughs> are uh, being respectful for our attendees. And uh, please, uh, Andrew and Martin, you know, shoot me a couple links to anything you've got that we can send out in tomorrow's follow-up email along with a video recording of this presentation and I'd, I'd love to get all of this information out and uh, Andrew as a as a presenter tonight we want to thank you so much for this this was great this was really really great and uh, you know let's let's do a follow-up tomorrow and uh, get you um, connected with anybody that has additional questions about all these, you know, you might be inundated, but, uh, you know, let me know how we can uh, connect people with you with follow-up questions. And, and Martin, thank you so much for your, as usual, uh, very intuitive uh, moderation of the Q&A. And uh, I know that we've got a lot of people that might have a lot of questions, so, uh, we're going to hook everybody up tomorrow so we can all uh, continue on with our evening. Um, any follow-up questions or uh, comments, Andrew? I just think Chris is such a great venue. Thanks for like jumping into this. And, you know, my, I just love what you guys do. And I'm, I'm just really excited, especially around uh, the policy side of things. Um, it's just such a fantastic time in this opportunity, in a sense, right now. Uh, to really make better living environments for people and their children, whoever comes next. For, this is a generational question. So, well, well said. And again, as a resident of the fire struck area, spared by a couple hundred feet, you know, I'm I'm so glad to be on the other side of this stuff. But it's it's a very interesting and relevant topic, and I really can't tell you how much we appreciate you stepping up and helping us out tonight and yeah. uh, with that we'll conclude the evening